members and ladies and gentlemen, if we could make a start. It's just come up to 11 o'clock. Um, can I formally welcome uh, members and members of the public to the February meeting of the uh, combined authority? Before uh, moving into the detail of the meeting, just a few housekeeping <coughs> points as usual. First of all, can I remind everyone that all my mobile phones should be turned to silence uh, for the duration of the meeting? And to ensure that everyone in the chamber can hear the debate, can I please ask members and people presenting to use the microphones provided? And as usual, the meeting will be filmed by officers from the Combined Authority and will be available on the Nosley Council YouTube channel later today. So, uh, those are the uh, preliminaries. So, formally into item one, apologies. Do we have any apologies? Okay, thank you. Um, item two is declarations of interest. Can I ask, have any declarations of interest been received? None received, Okay, thank you. On to item three, which is the minutes of the last meeting of the Combined Authority held on, June, on the 23rd of January 2015. Um, they are in the agenda pack, pages one to ten. Can I ask, are these approved as a correct record of that meeting? Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Okay, on to the, the first substantive item, item four, uh, transport for the north. And this is going to be an update on this um, initiative. And I think uh, Darren Kirkman um, is going to speak to this. Darren, thank you. So that people from across the 
I'll buy it rarely because he died benefits from passing his rail. Just on HS2, clearly the Liverpool City Region has an aspiration for a direct connection to the HS2 network, and we've demonstrated the strong economic benefits that would flow from such a connection. Uh, clearly, the One North work with a focus on east west connectivity provides us with an avenue with which to realise that aspiration and we've been encouraged by government to pursue this and to see One North and HS2 as very closely connected. So David Heaney's second report um, recognised the work that's been done as part of One North and called for the creation of a new group called Transport for the North, made of the, the, well, led by the North cities, representing all of the North. Uh, to develop a northern transport strategy alongside HS2 and the network rail. the work we've done as part of on North is a key input into that. The work of City Region had two key objectives that we're looking to uh, achieve as part of this work. The first is a commitment to a high speed east west line which from Liverpool, uh, which connects on to HS2 by the east west and north south connectivity and which is capable of accommodating four 400 metre trains into Lime Street. There's also a recognition of the importance of Liverpool 2 and the seaport, and a uh, commitment to ensure that we get the infrastructure and capacity necessary to ensure that freight uh, and the region's growth aspirations. Something briefly on, on the governance. All the list of the city meetings represented at all levels. From the, the partnership board uh, and the executive team, which is represented both by the city region and, and by the left. Uh, and the city region also leads on the, the freight work stream and the freight is, is represented on the, on the program board. In terms of what happens next, we're currently working to produce an interim report in advance of the budget, which is middle of March. Um, that report will be signed off by the Kennedy Exec team before it goes to um, the FT's Treasury. I want to ensure that all members of the Federal Authority um, see that report before, before it goes anywhere. Um, it's intended that the interim report will secure approval from government for a joint transport for the North the FT feasibility study um, to look again at the, the high speed rail offer for the Pool City region, taking into account. West, HS2, and our aspirations for freight. And then the intention is that a final detailed report will be complete uh, in 12 months' time in March 2016. That's all I have to say. I can take any, any questions. Okay, just before we bring people in, can I just ask Liam, Chair, Liam Robinson, Chair of Nerdy Travel Chief? Do you want to add anything to that, sir? Yeah, more than happy to see Yeah, really, just to kind of say that obviously this is not dated and this is nothing new to, to members of the Combined Law Authority. To Labour the point that Darren made very well, that we have a fantastic opportunity within the One North proposition actually to get a significant improvement for connections to the Liverpool City region, particularly around high speed rail connections. And that opportunity of getting a full high speed link into the city region, which will fulfil both our east west requirements connecting to the other big city regions and across to the east coast. But also link it onto HS2 to give us that north south high speed connections. Really, is a very significant opportunity. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of very detailed work that we've been doing specifically on that and feeding that into the process, and that is being heard very well and very receptively. So, obviously, we await uh, the final interim report to come back and be shared with members of the Environmental Authority. But really, just to let the point, there's some very good progress and detailed work on all of that accordingly. Okay, thanks, Liam. Um, members, any questions, comments, Roberts? Just building on that point, really, that first of all, I'm very pleased indeed, very gratified to see the uh, Mersey Travel and the City Region right at the heart of this one more discussion at <coughs> the working level on the partnership board itself. Vitally important we get this connection, we will understand the position of Liverpool and what it can contribute to the wider northern economy, the northern powerhouse, and the development of the, the North West. I think also in that context uh, is the, the freight position touched on by Darren briefly there, but uh, 
one of our one of our unique selling points, and I think we've got several examples, is the three energy model two. And really is something the North West needs, but the wider north is going to benefit from that. And I think we can sell that strongly and then we'll drive up the connection which west of Liverpool Manchester, but directly to the port there to touch more those could get them off. On that point, uh, just last Friday, in fact, the Secretary of State for Transport, Patrick McLaughlin, was, was in Liverpool. He was in the port. He was blown away by what he saw in terms of the two's aspirations, the impact and the development it will mean for the port. It will uh, increase capacity by threefold by the quarter four of 2015. But more than that, it is the link to the north of England. And that can connect that argument into that wider one north position. And that, I think, is, is my he then went to see uh, the Noble Industrial Park or the Matalan Distribution Centre, hugely impressed again with what's happening on that park, creating new jobs. But more than that, it's uh, developing that logistic centre on which this economy will <coughs> go forward with the great advances that have been coming in months and years. It's all part of that wider story. So freight, connections east-west, one north, HS2, HS3, all complex stuff, but right in the heart of it. Finally, it would be unthinkable not to have the local schools at the heart of any strategy, which includes a strategy for the one we want to do. Okay, uh, Joe? Yeah, thank you. I was at the visit with, with, with him um, uh, at the Institute for, uh, and we made a presentation to him uh, about the impact of the Super Bowl. We made a presentation to him about HS2, HS3. What struck me is exactly what I've been saying for, uh, for several months now, uh, in fact, for longer, is that we can make all the presentations we want to the management. This is a decision. And it really emphasizes the need because, in fairness to him, uh, he was blown away, not by the uh, figures and the facts and things, but just by seeing it himself. By understanding that if we don't uh, do something about the increase in freight that's coming through city port and the need to get that across and out of the city to the corridors that are available to us for most of all, but equally the HS2 HS3 connection. We're going to have car parts at the M62, we're going to have car parts at the M6 and all the corridors. And also the investment that we're going to have to make and it's important to make it to so accommodate the HS2, it's a large thing, we're going to have to develop and invest in there. So it was actually making those points and then showing the presentation visually that the penny dropped. And that's, that comes back to my importance that yes, we can have all of the information and all the detail, but it's who we present it to, who we lobby, who we take it to. So, you know, whilst Liam uh, uh, and, and yourself make the point about, you know, we're, we're making the case, it's whether it's getting listened to, and that's, you know, something that we've got to constantly do is make the case politically to both yes, this government currently and a future government that can expect what we want. We've got to continue to make the case strongly politically about the need for it. It's come back to the rebalance of the economy, of the northern uh, gateway, the northern investments on board and all those. If you're serious about that, then we've got to also rebalance the spend, and that includes investing to make sure that Liverpool will have a connection between West and East Tech. So I just make that point just simply because it is okay having, you know, all lots of documents, but no one's reading them. You don't count for them. Okay. okay, anybody else uh, wish to? Robert, well, well, you must come back at one point that you see this believing uh, as the key to it was that you saw all the, the scale of it all, and you couldn't really, you couldn't get that impression just by reading the papers. In fact, uh, we hope that in, in, in April we'll have visits by senior civil servants from CLG, Biz, and Treasury. To show them what we, what we can offer, how we can change our economy, and that of the wider world. And therefore, that, um, that conversation and bringing them to, to Liverpool and see what we have is vital. And that process is in hand now. We're appreciative to, to our champion here from, uh, from, from Central Government just to, to ensure that, that happens and to raise this visit to senior representatives from those departments. Again, seen as believing. Very good. Okay, so um, can we, can I first of all thank Baron for the um, presentation.
Uh, I think we're going to have uh, a further report on the <coughs> biopriority meeting on the 6th of March. Um, and uh, I think we take on board the comments that members have made. Um, and I look forward to making, hopefully, some rapid progress. So can we agree that? Okay, thanks, thanks Alan. Thank you. Great. Um, so then that takes us on to item five, which is the Liverpool City Region Growth Plan top-up announcement. And uh, Mike Palin from the left is going to take us through this. Please, Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the members will be aware that uh, in July of last year, the um, government announced a £232 million package <coughs> to the City Region. This was the growth deal announcement, which on the same day also included investment in uh, Centre City and some funding for a business growth club. In September, the Minister for Cities, Greg Clark, came to the city region and signed the documents. And then in uh, December, during the autumn statement, we had further success when up to £700 million of road investment strategy was uh, to be allocated to projects in the city region. In January of this year, government announced a further top up to the growth deal. So this is a relatively small uh, amount of money compared to the previous announcements. It's quite important because this is devolved to the city and region level to be administered at the city and region level. So the three elements announced uh, in January were a £15.6 million capital fund, uh, £15.6 million towards business growth, and a £0.4 million allocation to low carbon development. In terms of the capital fund, this is part of strategic project E within the growth plan. So this is complementary funding alongside existing European funds and also existing loan funds in the city region, such as growing places fund. The key issues with this funding source are that we need to have a pipeline developed. So the government expects us to have business cases ready to secure this funding. I'd like to thank Liverpool and rural people provided example uh, business cases that helped us justify the, the total allocation. Um, we need to get the alignment of this funding with other products absolutely right to make sure that we maximise the number of jobs that we create. Uh, the message that the, the developer community is clearly giving to the left currently is we need to target the funds very carefully. They, they fear that we may be subsidising rents. Um, so in effect, that by putting grant funding into a particular scheme, it discourages the market from investing in the area at the same time. So we need to very carefully target the funds. In terms of business growth, this was intended to be an extension of the very successful business growth grant programme we have to date. So, £15 million was bid for by the LEP from the Regional Growth Fund. Um, we are anticipating 104 projects will receive funding through this programme, as in the current programme we've already got. £93 million worth of private sector investment will be leveraged, and over 2,500 jobs will be created. And it has funded projects in every single district of the city region. So very quickly, I'll, I'll come back to sea drill and a smile is separate. But um, contract chemicals, which you can see on the East Lanks Road as you're driving out of Liverpool, they received um, funding and have already created 25 jobs. They are a specialist chemical firm producing chemicals for the food industry. Um, WSR Recycling in Holton, there was some media coverage around there. Their investment positive media coverage. They're creating 10 jobs in Holton. <coughs> Jay Leach and Sefton. They actually are a supplier to the logistics industry. So these are jobs being created as a result of the growing super port um, um, initiative. Um, I think Councillor Dowd attended the, that business to, to visit them when, we, when the funding was announced. Again, job creation off the back of the growing market in the Liverpool city. I said we need to target the funds better going forward. So these are two examples where we, where we can look to um, learn from to target the funds better going forward. So Sea Drill um, is a, an international offshore engineering company. They needed a UK time zone for their call centre operations, their engineering call centre. These are not standard call centre jobs, these are high value jobs. They considered multiple sites within the UK and then they chose to come here to Liverpool, 90 high value jobs, and they are physically moving into this building as we speak. They are renting floors upstairs. So it's a real good case study for the city region. 
another type of business we need to target are those that are exporting manufacturers. So Smiley is based in the world, uh, exports around the world, they export British food products. So they, they actually trade off being a British food producer. They've already created 30 new jobs as a result of the investment. So the key issues for the business growth element are the state aid rules have changed since the previous programme. So we've got to think about how we support the biggest businesses because they can no longer access funding in the same way. We need to get the fix right with other products, learn from our experience, and be better more client-facing in the way we do things. If we look at the distribution of projects by local authority area, certain authorities um, have had more projects than others. So we need to learn from that best practice. So, for example, Nosley have had a particular high number of businesses have benefited. Um, Nosley actually employed a consultant to help individual businesses access the funding source. So we need to learn from that best practice. We also need to promote the product better. Now that we have this funding in place, we need to get out there and tell businesses this available. And on the low carbon project, this is a relatively small amount of money in recognition that we have um, significant potential in low carbon and energy projects, but we've not yet done all the feasibility work. So there's four schemes listed there on the, on the slide where the government has part funded some feasibility work. We want to learn from, our, um, from the, the lessons from our investments and develop more schemes in the city region. Finally, just some overall issues and some next steps. Members need to be aware that this funding, as currently programmed, does not begin to 2016-17. So we need to ask government if there's any flexibility in bringing the funding forward. These initiatives would ideally start next year, next financial year, to help businesses. All of this spend has to be processed through an assurance framework. This is a procedural uh, process that government, if they're confident we're applying it in the right way, will devolve more funding to us. So that will have to come back to the CA in due course. There's also the outstanding issue between capital and revenue splits. Although we're receiving capital funding, there's no management pot available to us at this time. So we have to think quite carefully about how we find the delivery funding to get these uh, programs administered. Specifically for the 31.6 million, we need to promote it, get out there and tell businesses it's available. We need to develop um, a pipeline of projects to access this funding and we need to work with the market that subsidising rent funds. We need to be very careful that we don't discourage private sector investments. On a wider point, as a city region, we've been very successful in terms of the local growth fund. We are now um, the ninth of 39 in terms of per capita amounts received um, as a result of local growth funding. We need more projects to submit for future bidding rounds into we don't have business case ready projects to submit. So an example would be the elements of the innovation plan, and there's a presentation today on that. They need to be developed alongside all other projects so that we've actually got a, a, a list of projects for bidding to come up with. Just to reiterate the point at the end as well, we have done quite well, so we know that when we take that message to government, when uh, as members you, you lobby government as well, when we've got the business case too, we, we do, do very well if we are successful in obtaining the funds that we we're asking for. More than happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Mike. Um, right, members, questions. Joe. Sure. Well, on the question of the, um, the, the, the go back to the slide, we've got the split in terms of funding, and, and it's to support business and, and, and uh, you know, growth in terms of business opportunities. Is it not a, a really good opportunity? And, 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 it's a question really, and um, we need to not possibly think that. Is that if we look at the challenges that we all face within the city region, if we look, for instance, at our main strategic partners like Alpha, we've got real challenges. And, and you know, I've just been talking about the pressures on Liverpool, um, uh, as we had our star punches um, today. So, but around about £11 million in, in, in adult social care pressures that we've, we've got. And clearly that means that, that, that you know, the NHS and the health service are, 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 are facing similar pressures as we get more adults. So just given this as an example, uh, more adults dependence on care, people who live a longer, 
great news the problem for demographic the problem for local authorities is that we're going to have to support some uh, requirements that they need it's not an issue here for the, 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 the lack of if you like the accountable where the accountable body is this funded to develop new ways of working with the social, social enterprise the social enterprise network so look how we look at the bigger picture. I'm not just talking about tinkering, but for instance, developing you know, you know, uh, healthy people's care villages and stuff like that, that can provide support for people that don't be home in St. Helens, the whole city region, and, and take the pressures off the NHS and stuff with. But in, in terms of, you know, let's look, for, for example, uh, 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 just, again, just sticking with this one issue. For instance, some of the Della Proxy, some of the great two listed buildings that we've got, we can turn them into uh, social enterprises that actually support uh, the accommodation for elderly people across the piece. And, and we can train people to be fair with them, we can provide the, the investments in, in, into that using some of this money. But we get a longer return off of working with the NHS and other partners, as strategic partners within this particular sector. So where, where there's normally looked at the, the support of the private sector to take advantage of the fund maybe use this opportunity to use some of that funding to get out there and work with the social enterprise networks or have a, an opportunity for a wider discussion because you know what will is made the whole city region is faced with a real challenge about sustainability how we provide service and protect service with limited amounts of money so we've got to do things differently and so i just think it's a great opportunity for to us to look at the bigger picture on, on just that issue for health for, for the, as an example, but there are many other things for health alone. Is there a way of doing that? Is there a way of using some of that funding to, to, to provide the revenue support to actually engage the SEN, for instance, that sector, to work with the health service and stuff? Is there a way of doing that? I, I think it's something we, we, we should be seriously considering. I'll just move back onto that slide because of the red at the bottom. Um, we have to submit business cases to the government. <coughs> and this particular project, the business growth of 15.6 million, the letter we have received says that they, we still have to submit some further business case. We, we've already had the IGF previously approved, and so they've got to agree what the client business case. What I've, I've said to this, and this I actually intended to, to view this, this session today, is that don't just assume we want to do what we did before. Actually, let us have a look at this funding thing and see if we can find a better way of using it. And I know that within the LET, um, part of the innovation plan is how do we uh, stratify medicine, etc. These innovative areas in health where you can actually better profile the population base. And actually, maybe we can grow some businesses in the city region off the back of that by being the first mover in that area. I know that's something that's, that's in the innovation plan. And again, we should be looking into maximum flexibility with this funding. So we can channel it to where we can approach it is uh, and not always be stuck with whatever it was government said we should use the funding for. And it's certainly we will consider that. Just, just what, what addition to it do you, it's just, I accept that in UK CI or wherever it is or, or wherever it should be, absolutely delighted that we're looking at, uh, if you like, using funding uh, 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 like this in, in a sense of, uh, in, in a way that's invest to aim or invest to save. And that's what I'm talking about because clearly, that the, um, the, the old ones, or, or set of government ones, is the uh, funding to be better used in whatever way. If we can find a model that supports the social network, for instance, but they're able to support social authorities and health service by investing and getting jobs and training out of it, so reducing the pressures on the NHS, that's what sort of sure people should welcome. But my, 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 my ask is, is that we use either some revenue, let's get people together, let's get the SEM talking, and let's talk about instead of tinkering at the edges here, working with the NHS, working with UKTI or whoever uh, from or, or bids or whatever, to see if we can get a model that works that can help us tackle some of the problems, the pressures that we face in the future. I think that's certainly what we, we do, and it would be a collective effort on our part. Uh, the, the model for, regional, for the local growth fund is it's devolved to us for us to find the thing that's, that's best for us and we need to hold that line with the government who best knows what the local area needs which is actually the, the local area itself so we're, we're definitely going to have that conversation with the government over the next few weeks to understand and, and push for maximum flexibility in how we use this funding uh, 
uh, locals and yeah, local benefits. Okay, Robert. Certainly, the case that we, the, the LED network, the social enterprise network, this week, uh, earlier on this week, specifically on how do we uh, make best impact with the funding available. So there, there's an argument that it's a bit too crowded the landscape at the minute, and actually, we just need to understand what uh, product best delivers growth, best helps uh, social enterprises growth. Um, so, we're already having those conversations, we will be back to making this. Okay, um, any other <coughs> questions? Mike, can I, can I just ask one, one quick question? Um, and um, you won't be surprised, because I ask this question every time you make this presentation. I think fantastic results to have another 30 odd million uh, to add to, to everything else. And I think I've seen a slide where you've presented all the different pots of money come to over a billion, which is a, a fantastic achievement. And you know, to be 9,039 leps is, is, um, is a really good result. However, and I think you touched on it at the end, um, delivery is, is key. Um, no, no additional funding for managing this, all these pots of money. Uh, I suppose the concern is great that we've got uh, extra money, but what are we doing to make sure that we can deliver? Because at the end of the day, that is the key. <coughs> A piece of work has been underway, um, primarily focusing on transport initially. There's 180 of the original 232 million was transport money. Mapping specifically what we need to be able to deliver. We need to take that piece of work now and extend it to these other budget areas because these are, these are different programs, so we need different capability and different capacity. So it would be um, with the permission of members to actually go away and extend that mapping exercise to the skills domain where we've got funding and this economic development domain so we can actually fully understand what delivery capacity we now need for these additional funding sources. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. It's, 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 it's worth one noting in this particular issue about the Belgium um, is the main sector. Just a little bit closer to you, Mike. Right, right, so we can hear The Belgium community and faith sector are chief executives. Needs to be factored into the discussions you're having, Mike, about, about how we can deliver this. Anything else, uh, members? So, can I can I just suggest first of all, we welcome the additional funding for, uh, that uh, we've got. I think we need to congratulate Mike and, and the team um, at the LEP who <coughs> coordinated all of this. And uh, I think we look forward to uh, future presentations to the combined authority about how the uh, work around delivery is progressing. Uh, <coughs> so, can we agree that, members? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that then takes us on to item number six, which is the Liverpool City Region uh, Innovation Plan. And uh, pleased that we've got um, Alan Welby, <coughs> the Executive Directors from the LEP, to just take us through this plan. Alan. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just talk you through the context uh, in the paper very quickly before giving you a short presentation about the innovation plan itself. to endorse the, um, the, the plan at the moment <coughs> and go through to, cons go through to consultation um, over the next couple of weeks and then launch. Similarly, we'd like um, the Combined Authority to endorse our approach to start having a dialogue with government <coughs> to position this as one of our next 
next big planks um, for a growth deal, um, a combined approach to innovation um, across a variety of different uh, government departments through the scope of innovation uh, 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 process. Um, the plan itself has been led and developed by the Innovation Board, which was chaired by Sir Howard Newby going forward now, um, chaired by Jonathan Hay, uh, uh, Vice President of the Community. Uh, um, it's been an extensive consultation, extensive working through with the Department of Partners, and builds on a lot of great success that we've seen in the city region uh, in innovation. Uh, Enterprise Zone for Bid has been um, uh, announced earlier, but 130 million at Harvey Center, particularly, I think, is really significant investment that's announced um, at the All Port of State around big data for high performance computing. The document you've got in your pack is, is uh, sort of a, a covering document. It will be turned into a glossy. Um, it's also supported by a, a strategic activity plan, very much a detailed action plan, and a, a vast evidence base as well. Uh, if, if people are asking why we come to these decisions, etc. Um, the, the plan itself very much focuses on collaboration. Uh, all the projects there are about driving uh, collaboration. There are millions of innovation projects across the city, which is not having to capture in one of those. This is about focusing on big scale transformative collaborations. Um, and also, the plan is not really a strategy, it's a plan. It's about delivery. It's about really trying to make the step change in how we deliver programs and get a track record of delivering innovation projects at scale. In terms of resourcing that plan, uh, ERDF, this will be a key a framework for how we spend ERDF. The challenge, of course, is we don't have any near amount of money in ERDF that we'd like to spend on this. Uh, there's about uh, 26 million um, ERDF and, and 6 million ESF. Uh, and already in the dialogue with partners, we've got an ask of about 130 ERDF already. So um, the key, I think, will be um, using ERDF and ESF as a catalyst funding a particular growth deal and private sector investment as well. And then finally, in terms of context, this, this sits within a, in a wider context. We talked about the north of transport, but very much innovation doesn't work just in, in one borough or one city region. It works at scale and, and, and across boundaries. So uh, very important, this, this works with colleagues um, in, in Cheshire Let, Manchester Let, colleagues at Edge Hill University as well, really to create an integrated approach to that at scale. That's um, sort of the context. In terms of um, the plan itself, you know, very much the document you've got will be a, uh, an external prospectus, the government, uh, the private sector, and investors. Um, not just an R&D plan. There's a, a lot of focus on science here, which may confuse and, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, bewilder some people. But also, there's a key element there of social innovation. And this um, carries on Mayor Anderson's point about um, the challenges facing public sector reform, I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Uh, very much a, a framework for activity for the Innovation Board and, and partners, um, and, and supported by our strategic activity plan as well. Why innovation? Why is innovation important? Well, basically, if, if places are trying to compete, compete in a global marketplace, very difficult to compete on cost now, very difficult to compete on the products you make um, competing on cost in a global marketplace. You've got to compete on on either your knowledge, so can you develop new products that other people can't develop, R&D? Can you make, make things that other people can't make, so advanced manufacturing? Can you brand or design things in a way that other people can't do? So that's where the added value happens. Places that don't understand innovation and change, and economic change, will, get, will lag behind. So we really need to be ahead of that, positioning ourselves to compete in the global uh, marketplace. Uh, cities that are becoming more alike, so it's where you get that competitive advantage really um, comes through. And innovation really, really is the key to unlocking that. Um, obviously, a key driver at the, at the UK level for government and a key driver at the EU level as well. And, and let's be honest, the rest of the country is not standing still. If they got, they got their act together, it, they, you know, just look at the, the, the well, I personally think, the tragic effects of um, AstraZeneca moving from all the age to Cambridge. They're not moving you know, to another country, they're just moving across the country the country. So we need to compete, we need to make our places and our environments sticky. Uh, so it's about maximizing our assets. We do have a lot of assets. Uh, you know, Matt, you go through a lot, of, a lot of activity we have here in terms of uh, capability, either in hospitals, universities, companies. 
real two significant clusters on a national and international scale. I talked about scale being very important. So Daresbury, uh, one of the two national big science campuses, and similarly the sort of knowledge quarter in, in, in Liverpool, um, significant cluster of activity. But, but there is activity across the wider city region as well. Have significant companies as well that drive innovation here. Um, some of those large scale, some of those medium scale, some of those smaller growing companies. And some good networks as well. The challenge is we just don't have enough. Um, and that's the real challenge facing our economy going forward. We've got a good mix of, of, of assets in terms of uh, people, places, and financial infrastructure as well. So a good amount of <coughs> space, uh, some well-developed funds like the Northwest Fund now coming through in, in terms of um, MSI as well. Significant assets in terms of the student base as well. So we have things to build on, we have significant uh, activity. The challenge is to do that better, connect that better, and, and make an impact. I, I would say that when people in, in government are harmed are thinking about places with innovation hotspots, they're not necessarily thinking about ourselves in the city region. We've got to transform that, um, and we've got to transform that to, to, to private investors as well. Very complicated slide, don't expect you to look at this, but, but basically what you see here, these are all the kind of players that, that create our innovation What's pretty clear is it's not connected. We're not maximizing that well enough. We're not punching our weight in terms of uh, collaborating and prioritizing activity. And this is what the innovation plan is about, to try and get a much more coherent um, approach. Similarly, very clear coming through the plan, we've got a significant amount of challenges to really maximize our opportunities here. We need more businesses, have some significant players here, but a lot of their R&D is based, based elsewhere manufacturing our activity here, not necessarily creating it, so we need to create those, those more businesses, grow our own particularly. Um, the companies we have here are not uh, innovative enough, but a lot of uh, family owned companies may not necessarily see the need for innovation, so a danger further down the line, so we need to get those companies much more innovative going forward as well. A challenge around skills, notwithstanding the amount of, um, of uh, students we have here, we need to upskill our our workforce for the future activities and, and, um, and skills we'll need in the future as well. Finance for innovation, we have uh, some, some products at the moment here that are particularly need to leave in more private investors uh, and, and allow the private sector investors to, to back the companies to grow as well. We need a better amount of networks so connecting ourselves not just within the city region but across the north and internationally as well. And then finally, governance. I think one of the challenges we've faced in the past, we've had great ideas, not always put them in the back of the net. We've got to hold ourselves to account and deliver on this. So very quickly, um, the innovation plan, very much a framework for activity, um, building on our major centres and assets and, and trying to address some of those key challenges. Last slide from me, which gives you an overview of what the, what's in the plan itself. I'll quickly take you through the, the, the 12 projects we've got. So there are five key areas of activity, um, four sectors, so health and well-being, uh, solutions <coughs> sustainable growth, building on our low carbon and blue, uh, our maritime assets, advanced manufacturing, creative and digital, and then this area we'll call the innovation ecosystem. So that confusing map I showed you about connecting that much better, making this place stickier for people to work in. The bubbles you see, they're the 12 focus projects we're, we're working on. So at the end of this is very much about delivery, about focusing on, on getting these projects in the back of the net um, and, and getting ourselves a track record with investors, with government, that we can deliver these at scale and, and pace. So taking you through those very quickly, um, health and well-being, the first cluster there, um, the two projects that we're focusing on is Stratified Health. This is led by a partnership in, in the NHS, the Liverpool Health Partners, very much focuses on translational research on, on personalized medicine, so genomics. People understand the human genome, that will transform the med medicine and the services that people will get in the NHS. Um, predicted 20% more R&D, global R&D, because on personalized medicine by 2020, more global R&D companies. We've got significant assets in this, in this space here in the city region, but what we're not good at is translating that into products. So that would be a very much a, a commercialization program. My Liverpool um, is a large-scale program partnership between the CCG and uh, Innovate UK around assisted living, so helping people live in their homes for longer, dealing very much with some of the issues that uh, Mayor Anderson talked about. 
that's a significant uh, £60 million pound program at the moment, looking at technology. But we've been working with partners to broaden that out, looking very much about um, the future of social innovation and public sector delivery. So where, how can we grow um, local economies around the transformation of this? I would say here the local authorities are the game of the NHS on that. We've been doing a lot of work with all the local authorities on the patch. You are facing some of those challenges slightly more um, readily than the NHS, but I envisage that the minor level two, the second program, that will be a, a really large scale um, program looking to engage with social enterprises to deliver innovative solutions for care, care in the future. Um, advanced manufacturing, uh, a lot of work's been done on that, the whole making and process that we, we work through. Materials Innovation Factory, a big um, uh, program, a partnership between University of Liverpool and Unilever, looking at manufacturing on a molecular scale, so um, creating new products into the market there. That, that again, significantly backed by Hefty, so £46 million pounds worth of funding gone into that, and we'll have an open innovation model, so kit will be shared by lots of partners, you can use it together, it will create an environment where this will be a truly um, global hub for, for new materials. Sensor City, um, a, a building on the University Enterprise Zone of the two universities around sensor technologies. Again, very important. This will be will go to lots of different sectors. Sensors will go into your cars, will go into medical devices. You know, people are wearing personal sensors at the moment. So again, a big transformative sector going forward. And then the opportunities to link in with the manufacturing technology sector in Coventry as well, led by um, the uh, City Council. Creative Digital. Um, Again, trying to create a collective program around support for the creative digital sector. Quite <coughs> challenging. This is you have a lot of small companies, very fast moving sectors, so the public sector engagement is a more challenging. Um, uh, long term discussions with the Catapult Centre in London about creating a note here in Liverpool, and uh, partners trying to develop a, a what's called a frictionless content platform, so using content to create more jobs as well. Solutions Sustainable Growth, two big projects there. First would be Marine Energy Deployment and Operation Centre, based on some of the assets we've got in the Wirral, um, the opportunities around offshore renewables, really to create a, a centre there in, in world leading uh, understanding of how we deploy and, de and develop marine energy operations there, opportunities around the test tank. And then the Hydrogen Network, which is uh, an opportunity based on byproduct of hydrogen coming from the Ineos Claw plant in, in, in um, Halton. Pipelines underneath that plant leading to locations like the Heath and Daresbury should be able to access hydrogen on tap. That'll give you a critical advantage. If you're a company that needs hydrogen very cheaply, um, you can create that network, that'll be a real game changer. Finally, um, the, the three programs in the innovation ecosystem SciTech Daresbury, a very well developed public private partnership between SDFC, Hawthorne Council, Langtree, really making sure that we. Uh, maintain that, that, that prominence in government science, in investment science. Um, Liverpool Knowledge Quarter, it's a mayoral development zone, really making a step change in terms of how partners deliver and can drive that, making sure that, again, the opportunities to market it to the world. Significant building going on there over the next couple of years, Congress Hill development, etc., uh, the new hospital. So, how do we maximise and really create that as an opportunity for growth? Big data. Um, I talked about the investment going to head, the Hedge Centre around high performance computing. Um, big data will transform how we operate, how the public sector will operate, and how um, uh, uh, companies will operate and interrogate data, a real opportunity for growth. And then finally, Innovation Exchange, that's about trying to pull together all the business support programmes in the innovation space and create a much more streamlined programme as part of the business growth hub. That's it. Thanks very much for that, Alan. Um, okay, members, questions, comments, Joe? Comment, really. A good presentation. Uh, uh, it's a busy, this is really important as well. This is good if it's going to go into a document to be produced. My only sort of slight criticism, if you like, is, is the uh, connectivity and uh, support to the broad to the fast world fund. To the fast world fund, it needs to be a little bit of more emphasis in that. Every single activity is very insufficient. And actually, if sometimes <coughs> I have had less programs, you know, what I want to do is really ensure delivery on that. Um, 
there are a variety of opportunities in, in all these other sectors we we'll continue to work with. So, for example, um, uh, broadband or, or a variety of others in, in, in smart cities, for example, is another opportunity. They're not they're named as the sort of the 12 programs we we'll work with. <coughs> if we can really sharpen what that project looks like and how we deliver um, real growth and, and the governance around that, then you know, there is time to get that, that, that broadband program in there, I think, over the next couple. It's really about making sure we're getting the projects and programs we deliver on. Okay, Robert? Yeah, I'd just like to uh, really congratulate you out on this paper. It's been uh, an gestation for some time. It's taken several months to do it on this compared to but it is more out of original thinking. It's, it's a problem that hasn't been driven by a previous investment. It's gathering opportunities, defining them, and uh, especially them in a way in which we can take forward in anything. <coughs> I think also it is vital for any uh, city, region like ourselves, has to have these credentials. Um, we see messages in Europe and in the UK with this opportunity and ambition. And for us to do it, it's a prerequisite, it's not something which is desirable, it's essential, and we should have hands on reputation to sit as a native for a So that's my, uh, my second point. It also drives economic growth, jobs of quality, well paid jobs, and increases perception of how people. Viewers' reputation and absolute value for that purpose. It's, as always, it's translation into delivery and actual, not just a plan, not just a program of jobs and projects on the ground. And therefore, that to me is a key. <coughs> key. What are the next steps? Are they to a time scale? And each one's different, I understand that. But the, the, the need to be absolutely disciplined by the delivery aspect is vital. Finally, just oh, we do have a shining example of how this can work in practice already. Conglomeration, growth, backing with the state of Darsbury, site of Darsbury is an example of what's been happening here in this division for the last seven or eight years. Back by the end of the DA, it is now a national centre of scientific excellence, one of the two in the UK. It is fantastic. And that will grow when it's mature, it has the ability, the confidence, and the knowledge within it. And we hope these 12 programmes will emulate that success. So, very well done. Okay. In terms of next step, thank you, Robert. Um, it, it's, we are working day and night with partners to get these projects up and ready, really. Uh, some of them are, are, are up and ready, they're ready to go. Uh, but it's about the next step, um, making sure that when the first call comes out for the RDF programme, which will be in March, that, uh, you know, 130 million asks, they're not all going to get that money. So how do we use that <coughs> to and smartly to act as a catalyst? How do we get these partnerships set and work you and together on that? The, the, next, the next sort of... Um, uh, timetable would be I'd like to take that whole program to government uh, and ask uh, for a deal around all those 12 programs um, uh, and, and, and we have the governments in place then to sign that deal with government to ensure delivery. Uh, it just means we are working through with those programs to make sure A, what the answer would be of government would be, um, you know, are they rock solid in terms of delivery? How would enter investment really advance and accelerate that? Um, and we're getting there with most of the most recent, just concluding a piece of work with the um, health partners on the stratified medicine side of things. Um, but uh, I, I think um, we, we should be in a very good place to really start trading this with um, civil service over the next couple of months. A more informal uh, discussion with, with politicians post the next election, then leading to a significant bid into a, um, a next round of the growth deal at scale. Uh, and that's, I think, the key thing. If we can pull that off, which I really hope we can, that will put us ahead of the game. Most of the left in the country have done a very bitty piece approach to this project and going there. We create a big challenge, we'll put ourselves on the map, it will try and start to position ourselves as a place that get things done, innovation we understand, and a partner of government and private sector to do that. Okay, well, uh, Ronnie?
know, skills is right at the heart of it, isn't it? Um, you know, the, for those, those young people that have got to see an opportunity, uh, and I, I, the approach that we're taking is to try and embed skills into all those 12 programs. Because um, I think it's easier, I think, to prioritise activities. So if we can create a sensor, a sensor economy here, uh, with lots of companies that are working through that, and align the universities to provide those students, and there's some kind of conveyor belt pushing those through, 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 through their careers. So an easy step going from, from um, uh, Sensor City into uh, this city centre, into a company, that's what we want where we want. So we make those pathways as clear as possible. Um, and all of those, I think, that we're looking at to try and develop a, a, a skills, not just a high level skills, but a skills dimension to it. So we'll have discussions with partners and the site players about that and across the board on that. Um, where, where we'll crack that overnight, that, that, that would be a challenge because the mix that we have at the moment isn't quite there. As I said, we need more companies take those, 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 those people forward as well. So, and that will come, I think that's more of a medium term game. Yeah. I think, Ronnie, you, you've raised a good point. Graduate retention uh, within the city league has been a challenge which we've been looking at for many years now. And I think, I think we're going to be we're missing a trick if we don't link that issue to this innovation plan. I think it's, it's critical, really, that you know, we take advantage of our home prototype, so particularly in moving into that point. So I, I think we need to keep our eye on so, so take that concept around my little ball. We, if we can crack that concept of developing a joined up uh, economy around social care, uh, the, the positions here is a place that understands that future economy of an aging population, we create those social enterprises, <coughs> deliver those services which aren't going to be delivered through the NHS, etc. Now, if, if, we, if we've got colleges aligned to that, we started to get that, the universities aligned to that, so they're getting the right students to go to. And then we've also got the companies through. Then, then that really is about pure economic development. I can't see a bigger opportunity for us. Aligning all that is not easy. Uh, but, that, but that's why we're trying to do less and really focus on delivery. Uh, and David? Uh, I guess thank you very much.
foundation and, and said that, you know, it's student flats. Well, a lot of it is, it's about making sure that the sector that we need, like health and stuff, whatever, we've got accommodation, affordable accommodation, that helps them get on the ladder. So within that particular picture on that, what I mentioned before, we need to factor in that point as well. Okay. Um, Lisa? Yes, yeah, Chair, I think, I think that's a really crucial point because this is, this is a jigsaw. to comment on the green belts and all that <laughs> and then, uh, Alan, you can please know. But I think it's just something that needs to kind of stay on our radar because it, it's inextricably linked, isn't it, with what we've been talking about. So can we thank Alan for your presentation? And members, I'm just going to turn you to the recommendations in the report, uh, page 11, paragraph 2. So we're being asked to endorse the Liverpool City Region Innovation Plan, uh, ready for consultation and a formal launch and support engagement with government uh, on the plan, uh, particularly around seeking investments in the various projects and programmes uh, as part of the growth, the future growth plan discussion. So can we agree with those recommendations? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that then takes us on to agenda item seven, which is the 2015-2016 Mersey Toll Tolls uh, report. And I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Liam Robinson to present the 1516 uh, report. Thanks, Liam. Yeah, thanks very much. Obviously, members have got the uh, report in front of them. Uh, however, Mersey Travel <coughs> Committee met yesterday to consider the recommendation that we are sending forward to you, and I believe that's been circulated. Uh, but very briefly, we're recommending to the Combined Authority a freeze on all Mersey tunnel tolls, both. Um, fast tag and cash uh, tolls for all class of vehicles. The rationale is quite straightforward. Under the Mersey Tunnels Act 2004, uh, we have discretion to take on board economic and social factors, and we acknowledge that whilst there is some growth in the local economy, welcome as that is, uh, we're mindful of the fact that that is not uniform and strong across uh, the city region. So because of that, we acknowledge that tunnel tolls are part of transport costs which do have an effect on the local economy and are proposing that freeze. Uh, as part of that, we've uh, acknowledged and we hope that transport operators will reflect on this, and particularly the large bus companies or even stagecoach, act accordingly and we'll call on them to at least freeze their uh, fares that they charge or much better bring back some more cost effective and value for money options. But specifically with regard to the tunnel tolls of 2015 and 16, the Mersey Travel Committee is recommended to the Combined Authority a freeze on all tolls for the next financial year. Okay, thanks Liam for that. Um, now, we've got um, uh, a, a motion which um, Jo Anderson's going to move and I'm going to second, and I think we've got copies which we can circulate around to colleagues. Um, members, of, members have got it. That's it. We can circulate other attendees, that would be very helpful. Okay, so that's gone round. So Joe, do you, do you want to uh, introduce this motion, please? Yeah, just, just uh, the motion uh, reads, uh, Chair, that the, uh, the 
itself, the chair of the combined authority set up a task group to consider the options open to the combined authority to reduce costs of tunnel tolls uh, and its impact on infrastructure and transportation. The head of paid service uh, of the combined authority to produce a report for discussion to inform the setting of tunnel tolls for 2016-2017 uh, and beyond, and the uh, combined authority to press for a review of the Mersey Tunnel Act in any ongoing uh, devolution implications of negotiations. I think, Jay, just, just uh, asking the, the members uh, to, to support it, I think it, it is absolutely right that <coughs> we look at um, the, the tunnels and we uh, argue that we have done, you, I, uh, each and every uh, local authority member here for the discrepancy between uh, investment in transport infrastructure in the south of the country compared to the north. And you know, for me, um, I think it's uh, something that we have to actually force home uh, how we believe that the tunnels and we've been paying, uh, people have been paying tunnels tunnel for decades now, um, and we still haven't been able to eradicate the debt. There's two issues. One for me that we need to address. Uh, as a combined authority, how we uh, take money from the tolls and invest that in infrastructure. I think that's uh, fundamentally wrong. I think if all the profits that are made from the tolls should go to drive it down the toll, toll costs. So I'm asking for the review of that uh, by uh, this combined authority and also for us to take in uh, to the part of the negotiation with the government on further the inclusion how we can remove the tunnel act itself or we negotiate the tunnel act. We all accept that there has to be uh, investment in it to, to, you know, to maintain it, keep it operating and also the staff costs. So a renegotiation of the act or, or, or an ability for us to change the act is what we should be aiming for. So that's all it's called for uh, a task group to be set up, uh, including the chair of uh, travel itself and the uh, team of gentlemen and the combined authority members to look at ways for that's simply with us. Okay, thanks for that, Joe. Um, <coughs> I'll second it. Second, but there's any other members which still have anything? Peter? Can I, can I, uh, can I make a comment? Uh, <coughs> I thought this is uh, an eminent sensible <coughs> And I think it's, uh, it's time as well to the temple. I, um, I'll formally, formally second um, the resolution that Joe has moved. I mean, I, can I first of all say from, from the chair, I, mean, I, I do welcome the, the freeze um, Liam, uh, that the uh, committee yesterday made. I know um, certainly from where my rural leaders hat at, certainly my residents, um, I know uh, we welcome that. You know, we're already struggling with lots of cost of living challenges. So I think that's, that's really good news. And, and I think, um, Peter, your comment, it is timely but actually we, we do look at the whole, um, you know, the whole arrangement of <coughs> costings and pricing, et cetera, for the tunnel tolls, because, you know, we seem to go through this annual um, process and it seems to um, inexorably increase year on year. So, I mean, I, I, I do think it is a good idea to um, set up a task group where we can look at in, in depth at all of these issues. And I think it, it's, Absolutely, uh, again, the timing is, is excellent in terms of the devolution agenda, um, and that really plays into to that and to our asks. And I know the discussion is going to start shortly at official level um, between uh, ourselves and the government, and, and I know this is going to be, David, one of the, uh, the items on the, uh, on the agenda. So uh, I think uh, we can make some rapid progress on this and, and just start to make more, um, you know, more sensible decisions about this this huge kind of uh, um, burden that we've, we've been facing with for, for years, but never really, never really kind of tackled in a sensible way. So I, I'm delighted to um, second uh, Joe's uh, resolution. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask um, members, can we agree it? But I need to just point out um, 
uh, Rob Polhill as uh, leader of Holton. Holton aren't formally part of the tunnel tunnels legislation, so Rob, I think you want to just uh, register your, your position. Yeah, could I have my So, so we'll formally we'll formally call back Rob in a minute. So can I can I we've got the the resolution. Excuse me, the Chair. The, the, there's various parts that the audience haven't been able to hear, and what Councillor Polhill said then okay. wasn't heard by the audience, okay. but by the uh, public. Right. So I'll just read out the resolution. Resolution again. Sorry, I'll uh, 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 right, It's with, what Councillor Polhill said. Councillor Polhill, the point Councillor Polhill made is that Holton Council are not formally part of the, of the legislative arrangements around the, the, the Mersey Tunnels Act. So he's registered his uh, intention to abstain from any decision on this item. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Great. You're not raising as well. Okay, so with, with those qualifications, can I ask members, can we agree that resolution? That's great. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Okay, uh, so that then takes us then to item eight, which is the 2015-16 budget, uh, financial perspective. And, and John, you're, you're going to take us through this, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, the report should speak for itself, but most of the components have been considered in depth by the Mercy Travel Committee yesterday. So the intention is to be quite, quite brief with this. That said, it is the first year that the Combined Authority has set its own budget, um, and the Combined Authority budget recognises substantially more than just transport. It's also the first year that the Combined Authority will set the transport levy for the five Merseyside district councils also the city region with the exception of Holton. And I suppose the headline is from the budget is that the recommendations made by the Mercy Travels Committee yesterday are that the transport levy can be reduced substantially next year by um, 13 by 11 percent or 13.7 million pounds. That would see the transport levy reducing from 127.4 million which was last year to 113.7 million pounds next year. This has been achieved uh, principally by Mercer Travel as part of its financial strategy, which has been for a number of years now, but principally by focusing on key priorities and ensuring that value for money is a key consideration for our Mercer Travel activities. As a result of this, the amount required by Mercy Travel from the combined authority to fund its operations next year is reducing significantly by 6.2 million. In addition, there are changes in capital financing and changes to tunnels operations and tunnels capital program, which enable that levy reduction to be effective. The CA's accounts also includes non mercy travel, if you like, non mercy travel income and expenditure, and that relates in particular to the growth fund, the growth deal, integrated transport block, and highways maintenance funding, which have each been subject to further discussion and further agreement by the combined authority. It should also be noted that this budget has been set after very intense and detailed collaboration with each of our district partners in establishing the budget and in particular, in particular we're very mindful of the impact that levies have on individual districts who <laughs> set their own budgets. And with that, this levy reduction shows that Mersey Travel is recognising its need to assist in that, um, in that in, with the financial difficulties that the districts are in in setting the budget and put our shoulders to the wheel. But we also have to be mindful of the importance of strategic infrastructure investment in transport in particular in generating the type of economic growth that will be necessary to replace the revenues that councils are, are losing through the reduction of revenue support grant uh, with, with more sustainable local resources. In terms of Halton, very briefly, the financial arrangements in respect of Halton will continue for the next 12 months. Those being that Halton will set its own transport, which is part of its main transport council tax requirement. And any move to a differential levy will not take place next year, it will only take place after detailed consideration. Finally, there is an adjustment to the budget, which will be can circulate, and that's in respect to the previous agenda item 
and that would see a reduction in tonnage income of 1.1 million pound, with the corresponding adjustment to the amount that's transferred to to our reserves for capital finance and investment. It doesn't have any effect on the levy, and with that, I, I think Captain Robinson would also like to say a couple of words around the most travels deliberations yesterday. Yeah, thanks for that. Really, just to kind of commend the, the budget to the combined uh, authority. Very much want to pay tribute to join the team and all the financial teams across the districts for what's been a lot of very detailed close work over numerous months uh, to bring this to OG um, today. Obviously, we fully acknowledge the fact that um, because of central government cuts, all the districts across the city region are really suffering real financial pain. And it's absolutely right that Mersey Travel does everything we can to cut our cloth accordingly to assist with that and make sure we're part of the financial solution, not adding to the burden of it. So the budget work we deliberated over and agreed yesterday to bring forward for your recommendation is one that's very practical, very deliberable, and one that we hope will uh, build on success into the future. Okay, thanks, Liam. Uh, okay, members, so you've got the recommendations in front of you uh, in paragraph 2 of the report, page 57. Can we agree those recommendations? Agreed. Yeah, and can I endorse my thanks to John and the team for the hard work he's done on that? Thank you very much. Okay, that takes us then to item um, 9, which is the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority Code of Corporate Governance. And John, this is you again, please. Again, uh, very briefly, because this report has been to the Combined Authorities Audit and Governance Committee because it, in some detail and they're recommending the adoption of this to the Combined Authority. Just to point out, well, since publication of the agenda, some very minor presentational and, and, and contextual areas have been identified. So as well as recommending the, this report approved, we're also seeking um, seeking delegated powers for myself and the monitoring officer and with the chair to amend those before this is actually published. Okay, thanks for, for that uh, clarification, John. So we're looking at, again, recommendations on uh, page 71 of this report. Can we uh, approve uh, those corporate governance changes? Uh, great, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, just finally, few items on the minutes. So item 10 are the minutes of the Mersey Travel Committee held on 15th of January. Uh, can I ask members, can we confirm these minutes? They agreed. Thank you very much. And finally, the minutes of the Audit Committee held on the 13th of January. Can we confirm those minutes? They agreed. Okay, uh, I've not been uh, informed of any other urgent items, so can I uh, thank you for your attendance and contribution to this meeting. Remind you that the next meeting of the Combined Authority will be at 11.30 a.m. on Friday the 6th of March 2015, and I declare the meeting closed. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you.